Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Wolf Mueller. Um, <clears throat> I'm I let me start with my history because that's a little complicated. And in the meantime, I'm going to pass out some sheets. So take one, pass it around. Let me split for this side too. Take one, pass it around, get it around the room. You'll kind of need these tonight. Um, Born and raised in New York City, with, which is where I met my husband, Bobby. That's what I affectionately call him. He goes by Roberto, Bobby, Bob. Call him for dinner, don't miss that. So, <laughs> but we were both born and raised in New York City. I was raised in a holiness Pentecostal church, which absolutely abhorred creeds of any kind. I was taught to disdain them to disdain seminary. Seminaries were called cemeteries um, because that's where your faith died. And, um, and then I was reminded when my dad passed and I inherited his books, uh, about 470 of them, all theological and Calvinist. So I was introduced to the doctrines of grace and that it's not you who makes a decision for Christ, Jesus saves you. And so we began our long journey through Calvinism for about a dozen years. And then in that time, we moved to Idaho. <laughs> Absolutely love Idaho. I don't ever want to go back to New York City, even though my family is there. Love Idaho and the freedom there. So we found a nice little Dutch Reformed church up in Boise. We were in Mountain Home about 50 miles away. And we didn't mind doing the trek, because when you think you find a good church, you go. Anyway, um, God had different plans. And so um, we had what they called Snowmageddon year, 2016 to 2017 winter. We literally could not get out of our cul-de-sac. And after about two months stuck with no church, I said to my husband, I'm starving. Like, I need church and I need the Lord's Supper. And I didn't understand really what the Lord's Supper was. Uh, Calvinists don't believe it's the true body and blood, but something God was allowing me to crave. So he went and found worship for shut-ins, which is now worship for anew, which is the Lutheran Sunday morning program. And he said, I found a program we could at least watch while we're kind of stuck here. I mean, we couldn't even get out for groceries. Forget the COVID lockdown. We were locked down for five months in the snow. So <laughs> that, you know, whole three month lockdown in Idaho, that was nothing. Anyway, we found worship anew. We started watching it. I'm going, I know these hymns, the scriptures were read. The Lord's Prayer was prayed. The sermons were simply law and gospel and didn't have that little tag at the end that Calvinists do, which is the you get law, gospel, law. Because the second law is now you go do this to kind of prove that you've got fruit so that you know you're a true Christian because God chose some, didn't choose others. Anyway, that led us to Lutheranism. And when the snow melted, I was there in April and I went and I walked in and it looked Catholic. It looked Roman Catholic. Now you have to understand, little holiness Pentecostal girl and it looked Catholic. And so we went in, I sat, I listened to the service, which I absolutely loved the whole liturgy. I was totally lost in the service book, okay? Because <laughs> outside Lutheranism, you have no clue where you are in the service book. Anyway. Um, and then my husband came with me the next week, and we've been there since. Pastor came to our home, catechized us. By September 10th of 2017, we were full members. And I tell you, the difference for assurance for me was just amazing. So, got into the ladies' Bible study, which was great. And now let's zoom past to the year 2020 when COVID hit. I have been studying apologetics for, let's see, 12 years of study, bachelor's, master's, doctorate. And I love apologetics. I love defending the faith. I love telling people what Christ has done for them. 
Sorry, I get real emotional when I talk about that. Anyway, um, so a friend of mine said, you know, while we're all on lockdown, why don't you do a Zoom lesson on apologetics? Okay, and anyone remember the silly hashtag that was going around something or other together? So I grabbed the last part of it, don't remember the first, and I said, hashtag apologetics together. I invited people from my Facebook groups, my Twitter groups, and we started doing apologetics together. And I taught them the basics. What are we defending? How do we defend? Who are we defending, right? And even we went into world religions. And then I was reading the small catechism and a light bulb went on. Do I realize the creed itself, the Apostles' Creed, can be used in defense of the faith. So I've gotten in the habit of going to my pastor with my ideas, because some are way out there. So I go to him and I said, Pastor Kellerman, can I use the creed to teach apologetics? And he said that was the initial intent of the creed, <laughs> to teach people what they believe so that they could answer when asked what they believe. Creedal Apologetics was born. This was about a 12-week um, Zoom series, which I still do every Monday at 2 o'clock Mountain Time. So I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet. If you like what I do, come join us on Monday. If, if you don't have time at 2 in the afternoon Mountain Time, you can always watch it on Zoom. So I'm going to pass this around. If you want to sign up, it's just your name and email. There's no numbers. There's no nothing else. Anyway, so I want to talk about what creedal apologetics is. How many here grew up Lutheran? Show your hands. How many didn't? Okay, in those churches that you grew up in, did you use the Apostles' Creed in service or anything? No. All the time. No. All the time. Okay, so the Lutherans, all the time where it's the Nicene, and then once a year, I get really excited to do the Athanasian. I'm a little bit of a theology nerd, so just bear with me that I get excited on that stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so when you, those who raised their hands that they didn't use it growing up, when you first came into the Lutheran Church, how did you feel when you first heard the Apostles' Creed? And like everybody around you knew it by heart because they grew up and got catechized in it. How did it make you feel? I don't remember. Long ago. <laughs> I thought my wife would like it. She's was a Catholic. Okay, so there was a little comfort there. I felt like I'd been left out all my Christian life. I also am an adult convert. Um, the, I was 19 when the Holy Spirit used his word to convict me of my sins. And even though I grew up in a Christian home, we weren't baptized as babies, so there wasn't any of the sacraments. Um, but at 19, um, and we could just say I was, I was not a good girl. We'll just leave it there. Anyway, uh, 19, I was so convicted by the Holy Spirit with a verse I memorized as a five-year-old at the Christian camp I went to. It was 1 John 1, 9. And that's what the Holy Spirit used. So still using the word to convict. And then three months later, I was baptized. Um, anyway, I felt I'd missed out on this Apostles' Creed. Like, this is beautiful. So I started looking up the other creeds and, and everything, and I started researching. Then when I decided to do the creedal apologetics series, I thought to myself, well, there's really three questions that I want to answer for my online students on what, why I'm using the Apostles' Creed for apologetics. One. What does it mean to use the Apostles' Creed for apologetics? Like, what, what do we do with it, right? Two, are there any examples of it being used for apologetics? Or, you know, I mean, my pastor said this is what it was meant for, two purposes, one, to tell people what they believe, and then 
you know, as adults, they would get baptized or to answer for the faith. So who gives us these examples? And then why and how do we defend the faith using the Apostles' Creed? So those are the things I want to go through tonight. I'm going to go fairly quickly. Anyway, who has their Bible with you? If you can look up Colossians 4, 5, and 6, and then somebody else, the typical apologetics proof text, 1 Peter 3, 15. <laughs> and whoever has Colossians first, just speak up. That's how we do it back home. Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be, great, be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Okay. And then 1 Peter 3.15, who has that one? But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Okay, so I just want to briefly go through some key terms in the Colossians text. One, walk in wisdom. How do we get wisdom? True wisdom. God's word, right? Okay, so that means I need, if I'm walking in that wisdom, I need to know God's word. Okay, because that's going to be key when we get to the creed. Two, um, the ESV said making the best use of time, and I'm going to get to examples of how to do that. I don't like apologetic debates. I find them quite useless because two people get up to a podium and you have the one side who's for the negative side and then you have the Christian side and when, at the end when the moderator says, okay, show of hands, who won the debate? They're still split, rarely. Does anyone begin to question their worldview and come to Christianity through a debate? I don't like them. I like one-on-one. -on -one. Most of us can do one-on-one, -on -one, friends, neighbors, and so forth. So using the, making the best use of time is key. Okay, then it says, let your speech always be gracious. Now. I have to say, I'm not always gracious. I am a New Yorker at heart. <laughs> and so, and I tell you, driving in here was like going back to New York City. <laughs> I was like, I don't like all this traffic anymore. Um, but anyway, it needs to be gracious when we are answering their questions. It needs to be seasoned with salt. And if you look up the term salt as Jesus uses it, it's talking about us being the salt of the earth. We're the ones that preserve it and add flavor. Okay, and then that you may know how you ought to answer each person. It doesn't say answer the debater. It doesn't say answer a group. Paul is saying answer each person. And in apologetics, all you are doing is answering their questions. Like salt, you don't want to overuse it. Correct, exactly, that is perfect, exactly. As salt, you never wanna put the whole jar because then the whole, then the steak is ruined, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and there's no getting that cleaned up and then it's gone. So you always want just the right amount and you always want to be ready because Peter told those who had been dispersed through the Roman Empire because they were Christians, be ready to give an answer. For many of them, that answer meant martyrdom. But even with the martyrs, I have found in my study of church history the way they defended and answered for the faith. And it's, it's a lot easier than the 12 years of apologetics classes I took. My professors, they never had the rubber hit the road. Okay, I gotta figure this out on my own. So you're gonna get rubber hits the road tonight, okay? All right. So what does it mean to defend the faith? How many know that there are actual creedal statements in the Bible? Show of hands. Oh, good. Okay, there's one I absolutely love. It's in Deuteronomy, and it's Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, 
the Lord our God is one. That is a statement they had to teach their children. Just as many of you, I'm sure, taught your children the catechism growing up, and the creed was in there, and maybe through the liturgy and so forth, they had to teach their children because they were going into an area with multiple gods. They were going against nations with many, many gods each. Believe it or not, that's our world today. We live pretty much back into a pagan society. And so we are going in saying the Lord is one. There's only one God. Okay. Then you have the wonderful creeds. Um, one of my favorites, when in Matthew 16, 16, I'm going to try to give you the references so you can jot them all down. Matthew 16, 16, Jesus says to Peter, who do you say I am? What was his answer? Okay, there's a lot of creed in that. You are the Christ, the promised one, and the son of the living God. You're different than the rest of us. Yes, you look like us, you're human, but there's something else about you. And those are creedal statements. And then we have other examples, and I'm gonna give you the references. You can look them up later. But one of my other favorites, I love the Book of Romans, Romans 1, 3 through 4, is Paul explaining the lineage of who Jesus is, but also that he's God. And it's a wonderful verse to memorize, especially if you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness or Mormon. Okay. Um, then there's Romans 10, 9. And, um, and then the big one, 1 Corinthians 3 through 6. If someone can look that up, because that is a creedal statement passed from the initial apostles to Paul. This is what he was taught. He tells us this. So whoever has it, you can just read it out loud. It's 1 Corinthians verses 3 through 6. 15. Sorry. <laughs> the whole. No. <laughs> I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, and some have finally saved. Okay. Did you notice what she said in the beginning? I'm delivering to you what I received. This is the Apostle Paul. Like he wrote the bulk of the New Testament. And he's saying, this is what I learned. So it must be important if he's saying, what I received, I'm giving to you. And that whole passage deals with the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And that passage is key because he talks later on in that, in that section that there are 500 eyewitnesses. So if you're questioning whether Jesus rose from the dead or not, 500 people, and remember they only counted men back then, so there's probably a lot more, 500 people and most are still alive because Corinthians was written in the 60s, AD, somewhere around there. And so most of them were still alive. And he's saying to them, if you're doubting, hey, here's some eyewitnesses I can bring to you, 500 of them. That's pretty strong eyewitness testimony. Um, Dr. John Warwick Montgomery and Craig Parton, who is an attorney and an apologist, <laughs> studied it with Simon, under Simon Greenleaf's um, writings from Harvard in the 1800s and realized when Paul says I have 500 eyewitnesses, that is admissible in any court of law and their witness testimony must then be accepted. Did it make it to all the tables? Okay, everyone get the clipboard? Okay, fabulous. All right, so 
when he says I have 500 eyewitnesses, which tells us as Christians, there's backup on this. It's not just my feeling that I feel warm and fuzzy inside. There's actual tangible eyewitness testimony for the resurrection of Jesus. So those are the Bible creeds and the Bible reasons to use creeds. And if you memorize the verses I gave you, you will be surprised how often you can use them just in conversation. Anyway, I want to get to the ancient church because the Apostles' Creed, we all know, is not technically found in the Bible. But if you look at the sheet I gave you, and a dear friend of mine who was also an ex-Pentecostal charismatic and now a Lutheran pastor on his website from Geneva to Wittenberg, Matt Phillips, he sent this to me when he heard I was doing this. He looked it up and he said, here are the verses that correspond with each line of the Apostles' Creed. That is also in the book. Um, it's at the beginning to kind of give my foundation why, why I'm doing this on the Creed. And those other verses I gave you kind of expand on that. So read those verses as you can. Get them into your hearts and minds. Because trust me, you never know when you're going to be able to speak up for Christ and to answer for the faith you have. Let's face it, since COVID, we live in an even crazier world than we did before. And people are scared, and people are scared of death. Listen, I don't want to die either. At least I want it to be a nice, easy in my sleep, so I'm not really there to... <laughs> and then I know I'll be in the presence of God. But these people, they don't know where they're going. They don't know that they can have the forgiveness of sins and have assurance and end up in the presence of Christ. So um, that's the biblical texts that will definitely aid you. Now, Apostles' Creed, not technically written as we have it in the New Testament. However, um, if anyone is for familiar with the ancient church we have what we call the apostolic fathers these are second century these are my favorite guys to read and to study because most of them many of them were students of the apostles polycarp um, Irenaeus was a student of a student of an apostle so they're very very close Irenaeus has uh, what he wrote against the heretics um, and he called it the rule of faith and I want to read it to you briefly and you let me know if this sounds a little familiar he writes that the church believes in one God the Father Almighty who made the heaven and the earth and the seas and all the things that are in them and in one Christ Jesus the Son of God who was made flesh for our salvation and in the Holy Spirit, who made known through the prophets the plan of salvation and the coming and birth from a virgin, and the passion, and the resurrection from the dead, and the bodily ascension into heaven of the beloved Christ Jesus our Lord, and his future appearing from heaven in the glory of the Father, to sum up all things and to raise anew all flesh of the human race. Did that, any parts of those sound familiar? Sounds kind of like the Apostles' Creed. Okay, hold on. I'm not done. Then we have, now that's the rule of faith by Irenaeus. Then we have what they called the old Roman symbol. Adult baptismal candidates were taught this, that I'm going to read, had to memorize it and then answer questions by the presbyters before their baptism. Isn't that cool? Okay, uh, the old Roman symbol, roughly second century, and watch the similarity here. I believe in God the Father Almighty, and in Christ Jesus, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried, on the third day rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, whence he will come to judge the living and the dead and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the remission of sins, 
the resurrection of the flesh, and the life everlasting. That's second century, which means this is pretty much second or third century with a few adjustments that were made um, just before the Nicene Council. And when they were using this, Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John and a beloved presbyter, and the Romans came to get him, he's converting, he's, he's stopping them from, you know, making offerings to Caesar, the little pinch of incense to Caesar, and these Christians are creating havoc simply because they led more moral lives and they loved people and they rescued children that were thrown out windows and they helped injured people. This is what Christians did first and second century and they got in trouble for doing good things, right? And so Polycarp at his trial and they've got the steps and the, the pole and they've got the, the line of hay and stubble and stuff that they're going to burn him because and he right now is 86 years old and at his trial the proconsul at the trial says to him deny christ and he says 86 years i've served him he was 86 years old by the way point for baptism as a baby okay he said and he's never done me wrong and then he proceeded to explain who Jesus Christ was. And if you read his trial transcripts, uh, which you can get and read um, in at ccel.org, and just type in Polycarp and a whole bunch of stuff will come up. He actually explains, using the rule of faith, this is what we believe, and in the forgiveness of sins, and in the resurrection. And he goes through using the rule of faith, closer to Irenaeus's, but the basic, this is what we believe, which corresponds with Paul's in 1 Corinthians 15. This is what was passed down to me. I pass it to you. And that's what they did all through the ancient church, passed down. Now, if you read the martyrs, and I know Pastor Wolf Mueller has been doing some of the martyrs. He wrote two great books which I love, um, about some of the lady martyrs. And if you read their story, watch carefully for how they defend the faith. One, they do not go to their personal testimony. Well, see, I feel Jesus, and I feel warm inside, and I know Jesus because I walk with him in the garden. It's an old hymn. That's not, you know what? The Mormon guys that are coming to my door, they get a warm, bubbly feeling in their bosom, too. Well, well, can't use that. Okay, what are we going to use? Can't use personal testimony. It might be the stepping off point, okay? And I usually don't tell mine. My conversion was so dramatic. My boss think I thought I had a mental breakdown. That's how dramatic my conversion was. My mom didn't believe it until I got baptized, then she believed it. Um, but it was, not everybody has that. Most of you, born and raised Lutheran, you, you received the gifts of salvation at the font. You probably don't remember that, right? <laughs> okay, so, but those of you who were adult, you may have a story. Get off, jump off the story as soon as you can, because the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Jainist, the Sikh, the Shintoist, the Mormon, the Jehovah's Witness, the Pentecostal, the Charismatic, they're all going to have the feelings too. And you can't base truth on feelings because as we ladies know, that changes a lot. In a week, actually, in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, minutes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't want to go there. So you may, this is the why and how. Okay, I did all the first two and the basics in the scripture, give us an outline of this already and a foundation for creeds. 
the apologists in the sixth in the second century and third century don't want to leave those guys out give us a basis the story of the martyrs if you don't have a copy of the book of martyrs in your home get an older version get a like 1970s from like some thrift store or online discount place fox's book of martyrs exactly thank you um because reading their stories you're going to start realizing now that i've dropped it in your heads and in your brains that they use the creeds and creedal statements you're going to start noticing how much they do and how important the creed is so you might start with personal testimony don't stay there <laughs> just get off that step i do a powerpoint um at other things where I have like stones and I'm like, okay, the first one, maybe someone asks you why you're a Christian. Those with a later conversion, get off that stone, go right into, this is what the scripture teaches. This is what the scripture tells me. This is who I believe in because the Bible. Okay. Um, the second thing in knowing about the creed is each part can answer questions. And so we want to listen to their questions. I'm a New Yorker. I talk fast and I talk over. And I'm in a ru I'm, I'm super type A. So I tend to get in a rush and like someone's talking to me and you're not talking quick enough. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to go take the conversation. <laughs> I have had to learn and living in a small little town has helped. Um, but you want to hear what the questions are. So, for instance, someone comes to you and says, you really believe in creation? What's the first statement of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Creator, Creator of heaven and earth. earth. Yes, I do. Why? Like, evolution has proven itself. First, evolution has totally not proven itself. It's actually disproved itself um, just with the fossil record. That's all you need to look at. The, the oldest fossils are on top. They really should be on the bottom, and the newest ones are on the bottom. Had that happen? Um, but someone may come to you. And I've always approached it. My brother is an agnostic now. He's gone from atheist to agnostic. So little baby steps, right? Okay. Um, and I said to him, you know, he's my cre he's not only the one who created me and made me, and anything I've made, I love cooking and baking and making bread, I just love making those loaves and then delivering to neighbors because we can't have all the loaves I make. So you love what you make. If it's handcrafted, you, you put your heart in that. Well, what do you think God did when he made us? Everything else spoken into existence, right? light dark water animal everything's spoken except adam god formed him care hands on so to speak love formed him and then when he realized he you know he's alone he's lonely then put him to sleep to take his rib out to form eve his help me and so the amount of love that goes into creating, get them off the whole science idea. Talk instead about how much God Almighty, and if he's almighty, he can do whatever he wants, can create light and doesn't need the 1.8 billion years for light to go from one point to another, because he's God, because he's almighty. And that we don't need to know. We need to know, because our biggest issue is sin. So we need to know then oh he's father is god father to everyone in the whole world yes no why not because the whole world are, are sinners and god's not father to sinners. he created everybody exactly but he did not create sinners. okay my chapter on the father of god says exactly that thank you so much He's created us all. We are all his creatures and his children in that respect, but he is not, I believe in God the Father. He's my Father. The moment you, especially nowadays, the moment you get into that relational aspect of God, you're probably gonna get a little bit of a jaw down 
and eyes a little more open. They have heard enough television preachers with la, 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 hellfire brimstone to not have probably ever heard the loving part of God. When I talk to the Mormons who come in, and we invite them in, we have a chit chat. They even come back with somebody else who thinks they can out debate me. Um, <laughs> so we let them in, we talk with them. Hey, they need to hear the good news. They don't have a good concept of even Elohim, the Mormon God, who's father of Jesus and Satan, but that's another thing. Anyway, so when we're talking with them on evolution creation, use the first part of the creed, which speaks so much about the love. How do we know though, tangibly, God loves us? How do we know that? What did he do after Adam and Eve fall and, and the world goes wonky, what did God do to fix it? You mean when Jesus came God as a man? Yes. What were you he saying? Okay, so Jesus comes as a man. Okay, so second article of the faith. I believe in Jesus Christ, right? And what do we say that we believe about him? Only son of God. So that scratches Mormon theology and our Lord. And breaking each part, he's God's only son. So that's a special position. And then he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a Virgin Mary. Most get stuck on that, so you may want to jump to the next part. Suffered under Pontius Pilate. Ever wonder why the creed names somebody? Rooted in history. <gasps> Thank you. Have you read my book already? <laughs> 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 yes, it is rooted in history. Remember the eyewitnesses? Now we have historical. Archaeologists are great for saying, eh, Jesus didn't ever really exist. Look at the New Testament. None of those places ever exist. And I believe God has a sense of humor because they managed to dig and dig up somebody that the New Testament names, one of whom Pontius Pilate, well, they didn't dig him up, but they dig, dug up proof. Um, so you have a historical reference for those who come to you and say, well, I think the Bible was written by Constantine after the 400s. Really? Okay, let's go into history. Let's look at the archeology. span and let's look at the documentary evidence, even from second century Christians. And then we go into that he was crucified, died, and was buried. Now, most Christians, actually, sorry, most religions, every other religion except Christianity ends there. The person who formed the, the religion, whether they died by being killed, where they died of old age. They stayed there where it says was buried. That is the end, and I teach world religions at a university. That is the end of that story. And then their followers hundreds of years later start writing down things they heard the person say. So you kind of lose documentary evidence there. But that's where their religion ends buried but we have on the third day he rose again from the dead and that is the core of Christianity Paul says that if Jesus did not rise we are to be pitied that's the point in your conversations you want to get them to now this may take years don't stress it. <laughs> it's taken years with my brother, even though he grew up in a Christian home. It's taken years with my hairdresser. I was just talking to our niece who we're staying with. Um, she noticed my hair goes in a flip now, and I said that's because my beautician, who happens to be his barber, knows how to cut my hair with its thick layers. And I have been going to her now well over a year. And at the beginning, he was bragging, because that's what he does. He brags about me. And he was telling her, oh, she's writing new books. New books are coming out and published. Oh, that's great. Then they had a signing in the library in town. She was willing to put the, the sign up. 
And I said, that's great. And then she started asking about this book. What do you mean ap apologetics? Let me tell you. And then she goes, what, what's creedal? And I said, well, did you grow up like Catholic? She goes, yeah. Do you know the Apostles' Creed? She goes, yeah. I said, that explains what we believe and why we believe. She goes, it does? Yes. So as she's cutting my hair, and I'm hoping, oh, please don't be offended, because then the hair is going to go wrong. But anyway, um, <laughs> so I'm talking with her and giving her just the beginning. Because she said to me, the Catholic Church was a lot of do's and laws and regulations, and you had to do this and do that, and a lot of confession. That yeah, confession is great. Do it every Sunday. And there was even once I needed private confession because I was working on a project and getting depressed. And so anyway, um, so talking with her, it's been a year. We are not past God the Father Almighty. We didn't even hit yet, maker of heaven and earth. I mean, I have what, half hour with her once every six weeks. But the conversation may go that slow. Now, other ways the conversation may go is the neighbor's boy comes. He wants to help me pick the strawberries in our backyard. We have chickens in the backyard, but we also have a strawberry problem. They're called roly polies in Mountain Home. They're those little bugs that can roll up in a ball. Yeah, they like to dig into Bobby's strawberries that he likes to eat, and then I make strawberry jam, and you can't eat them. So the little boy comes over and we're picking strawberries because it hurts for me to bend down on my knees. And so he was coming to help and we're sitting there and two things happen. One, he says to me, a friend at school told me when Jesus returns, there's gonna be lots of fire and death and meteors and it's gonna be really scary. Good grief, he got the evangelical version of the end times. Okay, <laughs> now I'm thinking, how do I explain this to him? Well, right as I'm trying to explain, yes, Jesus is coming back. We don't know when and we don't know all the details. So I was going to do that. He sees my Luther cross. That's a really pretty necklace, Miss Nancy. What's in the middle? It's in the middle of Luther's cross. Of uh, Luther's rose is a cross. Wonderful. I can switch. I took the roly-poly eaten strawberry this is what your heart looks like to god with the holes in it he goes ew that's disgusting yet he mind you he was like six when i did this yes it is and he goes oh well i wouldn't want that i said right god doesn't want this kind of heart either and i pull a really good strawberry out from the patch and i said this is the one he wants to give you really really like that's perfect i said right he goes the other one goes to the chickens he goes that one i can bring home the mom right then and there i had an opportunity to talk about the forgiveness of sins next time he came over he started saying to me you talk to me that god god is a father and he's your father because i'd gone through that with him I said, yes. He goes, so if I, watch this, seven years old at this point, year later, if I believe in Jesus, does that mean I end up with two fathers, my dad and God? Yes. Little by little, talking with this child who comes from an unchurched home, parents never went, grandparents never went, they were never brought. Little by little. But this is how using the creed just saying to him, Jesus died, but he's not dead anymore. Is he like a superhero? Much better than a superhero. Talking to a six, seven, eight-year-old. Talking to a person that you're always going to see. You know, you get in the same lane at the grocery store. Just mark up a conversation. When COVID, when we were all allowed out of the house, I got myself a mask that had the Luther Rose on it that said, here I stand, you stand over there. <laughs> you wanna know how many conversations that started? Oh my, and the, and the Mormon lady, whose lane I always make sure to go to, she looked, she goes, what a pretty flower. Yes, it is. Is that a cross in the middle? Yes, it is. Why do you guys who are Christians keep the cross? Because Jesus died on there for the forgiveness of my sins. What? 
You have forgiveness? Yes. Well, you know, you got to be good to get to, to, to make it out of this life. And I said, you know what? There ain't no amount of good that any of us could do that would be good enough for the good God. And conversations like that. And using the creed. Even, I was asked on an LWML Zoom, how do you use the creed with somebody who says, I don't want to go to church anymore? It says here, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, here we go. The Holy Spirit is in charge of the Holy Catholic Church. I go there for the forgiveness of sins. I don't go there to do for God. God is there to do for me. That is a concept your evangelical friends will be blown away with. When you explain to them you go to church because God serves you with the forgiveness of sins, they'll be like, no, 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 you go to church to worship God. Well, yes, that comes. But the main point is to receive absolution, hear the word, and receive the true body and true blood of Christ. God is serving me. In fact, at the altar, Jesus is serving me his own body and blood. And bringing that out to them changes the paradigm from I have to do church, which you don't want to go do church because it's the same thing, but till to, it changes to I go because God is there to serve me, to forgive me, to feed me, to strengthen me. Different concept. So the creed can be used wide range from the complete atheist in talking evolution straight through to the Christian that's been hurt with the to-do list that is longer than the Ten Commandments in most charismatic and evangelical churches. You can use each line, line by line. And in the book, that's what I do. I take you through line by line. And um, there was one thing I learned, and then Pastor Wolf Mueller pointed it out on your stained glass, that you have the humiliation of Christ. And then you have the exaltation. See, I didn't learn that as a Pentecostal. You know, we just jumped to Pentecost Sunday. That, that was it, you know. Oh, yes, Jesus died for you. Come down to the altar. Give your life to Jesus again for the 29th time that year. And then, and then we go to the happy, clappy, speaking other things that aren't tongues. Um, so when I learned the humiliation of Christ and that that began when he was conceived, that, to me, absolutely showed the love of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit for me. God came down like us to live, to obey the law, because I couldn't, wouldn't, and didn't, and to die for me and to rise again. And um, there is the reason I want you, when you are talking to them, to somehow get that resurrection part in there. Because that's that what proved the sacrifice was accepted. And so get to that, because if that didn't happen, one of my favorite church historian, Yaroslav Pelikan, said on his deathbed to his confessor priest, if the resurrection didn't happen, nothing matters. If the resurrection did happen, nothing matters so get them to that point remember there was a reason the creed was written there was a reason luther used it in a, for the small catechism these are what we believe it tells us who we worship and what he has done for us so um got a few minutes any questions yes ma'am Okay. Um, well, that meant really. <laughs> right. Well, you have to know a little bit of, of church history and a little bit of the archaeological finds. So, if you have someone like that, I would recommend getting some of the Christian archaeological journals, just kind of perusing through them to be able to back up that this was not written by Constantine in the 400s. 
this was written, we have parchments and manuscript sections all the way. The earliest one I have found out is like 60, 60 AD, somewhere around there, maybe a little sooner, maybe a little later, which on one side has uh, the Lord's Supper and the other side has Mary Magdalene's story. And so they call it the Magdalene parchment. It's first century. How did, where'd that come from? And then we, we have manuscript evidence from prior to Constantine. And so you have to kind of look at that and say, yeah, but the evidence is it was written before everyone says, like Discovery Channel, History Channel, before they say it was written. Look, we actually have copies from earlier times. And they'll say, oh, but they didn't really mean what they What's beautiful? Okay. Then you want to read up the early church sermons, and you can get many of those Polycarp's, um, the Didache, even which is a baptismal instruction and in how to handle things as Christians. They took this very seriously. And I go to Polycarp a lot because he was John's disciple. And I'm like, well, if John knew he was making this all up and it didn't really mean what it meant, why did he let Polycarp go on and just say it was real? Like a disciple has to learn from their teacher. So there, there is a lot of play with reading some of the older stuff. But there's a lot of YouTubes. In fact, my YouTube channel, I, I did a whole thing on documentary evidence of the scripture and you can always check that out and get some ideas and then I give resources as well. Yes sir? What do you do with this whole JDPW stuff? My <laughs> sister is Jewish and she's you know and not only just JDPW but it's like well they actually just put all this together to make a myth to explain why they like they didn't all descend from the tribes didn't actually descend from Jacob but it was just a bunch of disparate people that wanted to make a form an association, so they made up this myth of how they're all related. Okay, there, there's a good response to that because I got hit with that JDP stuff, and 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 uh, when I went for a second master's at a thought it was a good co uh, university, but a little liberal. Um, can you give me the archaeological proofs for their theory? There are none. Just as, has anyone here heard about the Q manuscript? Yeah, okay. There is no documentary evidence for Q. It was a theory posited in the 70s by two Jewish scholars who were trying to rip apart the gospel. There's no Q. There's no document that matches their theory of Q. Every time they find another New Testament manuscript, guess what it matches? The Bible we have. And this is another wonderful thing. God has preserved a lot of this. A lot of it has been preserved in the sermons of the early church. But when someone comes to you and says, yeah, this Mark, Luke, and Matthew were all based on Q. Can I see the document Q? It will be absolute silence because nobody has a document that matches their theory. What we have is the New Testament documents. Okay, any other questions or? <clears throat> I have a, yes. I have a, actually, I have a series of questions. Um, okay. <laughs> so with regard to um, knowing your person you're talking to, um, I kind of think of people, I don't believe in races, I believe in one race. Mm -hmm. So I think of people as being part of tribes. So there's a tribe of atheism, mm -hmm. there's a tribe of agnosticism, there's a tribe of Gnostics, a tribe of Hindus, Buddhists, Taoists, they're all tribes. So basically, the way I would, the way I would talk to them is I, just, I, I would understand how were they catechized? I mean, I may not use that term, but I'm gonna say, what is your paradigm? Why do you believe what you believe? And then usually they'll say, well, I read such and such, or I, you know, they'll give you some flimsy book that they've read and then I'll say things to the extent, well, tell me about your book. And now they can tell me, and they can try to catechize me, and uh, then usually I'll, I'll listen mostly, and then over time I start shooting holes in their, in their whole paradigm. 
Right, and, and that's basically defending the faith. You want to remove the hurdles they're gonna put up along the road to salvation. Uh, John Warwick Montgomery, my, uh, apolog my very first apologetics professor, then I got to go to his uh, academy in Strasbourg. He said, salvation is a road to the house of salvation where the door of salvation Jesus Christ is. You remove the hurdles as you're doing, reading what, what they told you you believe, they believe, so that you are better prepared. Remember the verse in First Peter? Be prepared always for an answer. So you, now you're prepared better. This takes time. This takes love. Uh, Colossians said, season it with grace. This takes mercy. This takes seeing them without Christ and how it will end for them. And so preparing that answer is what you need to do. Are Pentecostals fair game or not? Oh, yeah. I do that all the time. <laughs> I have no problem. Anyway, just some of the books that are there while Pastor Wolf Mueller comes out. The Accidental Lutheran, that is about how Bobby and I became Lutheran. Then I have Reasons to Reason, if you've never done apologetics, why it's good for Christians. And then I have They Were Eyewitnesses. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I know you ordered Creedle. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Pastor. Yeah, no, stay here. Stay oh, okay. here. So. <laughs> yes, it does a lot of content, so thank you so yes. much for that. Uh, but Moses, maybe the underlying thing to remember is that uh, in some ways we already have everything that we need, right? It's already in the back pocket. We have the Ten Commandments, we have the Creed, we have the Lord's Prayer. So that all these kind of somewhat intimidating conversations, where the Lord has already equipped us for it. And we have one thing we have that. Amen. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 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 So that you can know these things and give an account. Yeah, that's right. Amen. It's wonderful. Christianity, I've been meditating on this a little bit. Christianity is an argument. I mean, it's a lot of other things too, but it, it is saying that the truth that we confess is the best. The most beautiful, it's true and good and beautiful, and the most true, the most good and the most beautiful, and every other, everyone else is making an argument with their life, like here's what's right, or here's what's good, or here's what's true, and Christianity is not only the true truth, it's the good good, and the, it's the, the best best, the best most beautiful thing. So we have really a, quite a gift uh, to offer to the world. So thank you for your work, and I want to say a prayer for you. and. Um, thank you. And for all of us, that the Lord would give us joy. And then sticking around for a while, you'll mm -hmm. have the books on there. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Uh, oh, Lord, we thank you for your kindness and great love for us, that you've given us the apostles and prophets and your word, which gives us hope and life. We thank you for the creed and the great confessions of the church. We thank you that you give us your Holy Spirit and faith and hope that abides to life everlasting. We give you thanks for your daughter Nancy, the gifts that you've given her, and the wisdom that she shared with us. We pray that you would continue to bless her and Bobby uh, in the work that you've set before. We pray that you would give us confidence always in your truth, uh, that we would uh, not only stake our lives on it, but also commend it to those that you've put into our own lives, our friends and neighbors and family. For we ask all this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Oh, Amen. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. You guys don't let up on her. Keep asking questions. And I'll be over at the table. If you want to buy Thanks, and you want it signed, I will be there.